sing a couple of hymns so y'all sing along with us loud so we can hear you, all right? Da, da, da. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into Preacher, I'm going to take over. Get a run and jump. <laughs> that would go viral. Good morning. Possum said, get a run and jump. I am not Ron Pelfrey, but he will be here next Sunday, Lord willing. This morning, I'd like for us to take our Bibles and look at the, um, the letter of Galatians. We're going to read chapter 5, verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. Galatians 5, 13 through 16. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. 
I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's pray together for a moment. I'll do it silently for a moment and give everybody a chance to offer up their own prayer. we live in a world that gets smaller every day. As we sit in our cars from Japan from Germany as we breathe Saharan dust We realize just how small our world is and how connected we are. We thank you for the great blessing that our nation has been, for the men and women who made this nation. And though we are a nation with sins, we are a nation with high ambition moral ambition, ethical ambition. We are a nation that tries to do the right thing. Guard us as we consider the right way to live. Teach us as we struggle against our own sin and show us your way. Lord, lead us through your word that we might come to an understanding of your will and knowing it, that we might obey, that in all things we would be dear and pleasing children in your sight. We beg this this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the wind has been bad a lot of our Sundays, but it's a great deal more powerful today. You might have heard the noise the whole time David was singing. We put a cover over it and it didn't seem to do very much good. My wife plays a game with me. When I get out of the shower, she likes to give me shark hair. She likes to take my hair and just, while it's still soapy, and pull it all up to a peak, like we used to do our children. And then she'll make a joke, leave it like that. Well, this morning, the Lord, I think, is going to give her her wish. I would have to have polyurethane keep this thin hair down. Our nation was built on the idea that we belong to God. And as such, we have rights that come from God and not our government. We had a while back that... Um, Elena Kagan was being questioned to, be, to become the next Supreme Court Justice of our Supreme Court. And she was asked about this, our, our, our religious underpinning to our Constitution, and she refused to speak religion. So T Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma asked her this question. He said, so you wouldn't embrace what the Declaration of Independence says, that we have certain God-given inalienable rights that aren't given in the Constitution, that they're ours, ours alone, and that the government doesn't give them to us? And she, of course, denied that opinion. That is a battle going on in our nation now. Where do our rights come from? And we need to understand the idea behind it. <clears throat> you see, in every other nation on this planet, rights are given by government. That sounds like a good thing. 
But if our rights are given to us by the government, they can be taken away by the same government. We believe, the writers of our Constitution believe, that we have rights that come from God. Amen. They supersede government. Let me read the words again from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths, universal laws for all creation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. They don't need another government to support them. They are true on their own. That all men are created equal. That means we are created to be treated as equals. The idea of equal justice under the law comes from this idea that they are endowed by their creator with certain, as John Adams corrected it, certain unalienable rights, rights that no one can take from you, no one can relieve you of, that among those there are more but among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those three. The framers of our Constitution believed that without those three rights, we would be slaves. If anyone can take away your life, they own you. If anyone can take away your freedom, they own you. And if anyone can take away what they call the pursuit of happiness, John Locke called it your property, or your purpose, they own you. If our rights are given to us by Congress, Congress can take them anytime they want to. Ask yourself the question, does Congress have the power to take away our right to life? When we Christians fight against abortion, it's because we believe that every human being has a right to live, no matter how inconvenient. The Bible says the only way you can take a life is in self-defense. If Congress had the power, if they gave us the right to life, they could simply say they're voting groups they don't like, and so they're going to neutralize them. Does Congress have the power to take away our right to liberty? Every socialist government in the world, every communist government in the world claims the power to take their people's freedom. And those people are slaves to whatever the government wants. Thirdly, does Congress have the power to take away our right to the pursuit of happiness, our right for purpose. You know, your purpose of life might be different from what anyone else thinks is prudent. Your purpose might be different than anyone else wants you to have. The government might want you to be a bricklayer and you want to be a songwriter. Think of a world where the government took your purpose from you. What happens in a country where this happens? Well, we've seen it. We've seen it in Russia, where the number of people that Joseph Stalin is said to have killed is in the scores of millions. We've seen it in China, where Mao Zedong is credited with killing somewhere between 30 million, and if you take the famines from the fires they had, 300 million. Or the mounds of skulls in Cambodia, or the death squads in Cuba. Even now in Venezuela, there are people riding around on little mopeds with guns, communists, who are looking for their opponents and arresting them. Only funny thing about those arrests, many of them are never seen again. What happens in a country where they can take away our rights? 
And Christians need to understand that the basis for our freedom is an understanding of God through Jesus Christ. The founders of our Constitution were not all Christians, but they were mostly Christian. They were mostly deist. They believed in God. And with a simple, they were driven by a simple thought that if God made me, then nobody had a right to mess with me. That is the intellectual underpinning of our nation. And when Christians stop being Christian, well, you see what happens. Our scripture begins, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. You know, God doesn't force us. He calls us. He calls us to be saved, but it doesn't stop there. He calls us to do great things. He calls us to step across the street to our neighbor. Whether our neighbor be of another faith, of another political party, or of another race, God calls us to act like Jesus. We have been called. Now because we're called, we can say no. It is stupid to tell God no, but let's face it, he gives us that right. God gives us the right to go to hell if we want to. But we shouldn't do that. We should be smarter than that. It is the job of everyone who calls himself Christian to listen for the call of God and then listen to the call of God. God calls us to be free. You brethren have been called to liberty. God says leave the chains of sin and be free. Be free from the fear of abuse of those who take your life because you've stopped being an abuser. Be free from outside restrictions that would take away your liberty because you've stopped enslaving others. Be free from destruction because you've stopped destroying other people's right to the pursuit of happiness. You see, our problem is the slavery of sin. The reason we don't do what God wants us to do is because of sin. And the first thing we have to do about sin is confess it. And the second thing we have to do about sin is repent of it. Nobody can be helped if they refuse to confess their sin. And listen, the Bible is very clear. There is no one without sin. No, not even one. My mother used to warn me. She said, be careful when you point your finger. You got three more pointing back at you. There is no one in this country without sin. But unless we confess our sin, we can't repent of our sin. And until we repent of our sin, we can't be free of it. Let me finish verse 13. I read the first part. Let me read all of it. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Just because God gives us freedom, don't use that freedom for sin. But through love, serve one another. It's sin that keeps us from being free. And yet we hold on to it. Like Eve in the Garden of Eden who looked upon the forbidden fruit and saw that it was good to eat, we look at sin and, well, it looks good to us. I had, I knew a, I knew a pastor in prison for about three years. He is, who was himself a murderer who came to know Jesus Christ in prison and found his purpose of being 
by being a chaplain in the in the um, in prison. So that he cleaned up his life so well, they offered him his freedom, and he refused. He said, "This is where my church is." And he told me once, laughing, while we were eating lunch together, he said that the most common words you hear in prison are, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. That's what Eve did when she bit the forbidden fruit. Sin makes slaves out of us. We commit sin and then we're trapped. Paul says, instead of that, through love, serve one another. There are two words in the Greek I want to play with here. First is the word love. There are a lot of words for love in the New Testament. But this word love is the word agape, which means a love that puts the other person first. Paul says the way that we avoid the slavery of sin is through a love that puts the other one first, serve one another. Now we are a country of people who look after number one. We look after ourselves. But the Bible says we put others first. The word charity in the King James version of the Bible is actually the word agape. When we give charity, we're loving another more than we love ourselves. Second Greek word there is the word serve. Now the normal word for serve is to minister, which by the way is the word that deacons come from, but the word here is the word do you owe, which means to be a voluntary slave. Much more powerful word. Through love that puts the other first, be a voluntary slave. You say, preacher, that doesn't sound like very much for me. Well, Jesus said, he who would be greatest of all must be servant of all. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you have to be the greatest servant. Because there is no one who put others ahead of himself more than Jesus. And for us to be like Jesus, we have to put others first. But it's our love of sin that keeps us from this. Seek wants to, sin wants to own us. It seeks to own us. If you engage in sin, when we engage in sin, it tries to find a way to grab us, to own us, to trap us. We know this. We know that we've engaged in sin that first seemed like a good idea, and then later on we found out we were trapped in it. Like the old Br'er Rabbit story. He saw a tar baby and he punched it and his fist was stuck. He punched it and that fist was stuck. He kicked it and kicked it and his feet were stuck. The more we fight sin, the more we're into sin, the more we're trapped. Paul began this chapter with the words in verse 1, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. If we're going to fix what's wrong in our marriages, if we're going to fix what's wrong in our families, if we're going to fix what's wrong at work, if we're going to fix what's wrong in our country, it's going to begin with confession of sin and repentance from it. We have to deal with sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, for sin shall not, must not, have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace everything that is wrong in our world today is due to sin 
Every problem we face, every problem you face is due to sin. But we can only be free in Jesus. There is no one of us who's good enough to clean up his or her life on our own. We can't do it. We're not good enough. We're not strong enough. We can only be free in Jesus. Jesus told his disciples that. In John chapter 8, he said, and many of y'all have memorized this, these two verses. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Only in Jesus Christ can we be free, because only in Jesus Christ do we know the truth. Without Jesus, we are doomed. Not just disadvantaged, not just in trouble. Without Jesus, we are doomed. And we need to realize that for our world as well. Everyone we meet, everyone we know without Jesus is doomed. How dare we let our loved ones, the people we say we love and care about, not know about Jesus. Now they are called, so they have to answer. But shame on us for not telling them. Verse 14. For all the law, all the law of God is fulfilled in one word, in one message, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We can obey all the law of God if we love our neighbor as ourselves. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. There's an old country music song where the woman tells her husband who's mad at her, while you're throwing dirt at me, you're slowly losing ground. The more I chew my wife's head off, the less wife I have. The more we cut down the people we say we love, the less we have to love. Our citizenship must be Christ-like. The best thing I can do for my wife is give her Jesus as a husband. The best thing I can do for my children is give them Jesus as a father. The best thing I can give my grandsons is Jesus as a grandfather. The best thing I can give to you is Jesus as a pastor and so for you. I mentioned John Locke earlier. Maybe you haven't heard of him. He was actually the writer of the, con the original Constitution of the State of South Carolina. He was a British philosopher who was trying to find a way to have a government without a king. You see, kings were, royalties were already settled. They would say, well, how, how does the king rule? Well, God said so. They called it divine right. And, the, and people understood that if we're going to have a government that does not have a king, that does not have royalty, we're going to have to philosophically explain it. And so John Locke was the expert that the founders of our Constitution studied when they built our Constitution. And he wrote, John Locke did, if the Gospels and the Apostles may be credited, in other words, the New Testament, no man can be a Christian without charity, without the love that puts the other first, and without that faith which works not by force, but by love. No one can be a Christian who does not love his neighbor more than himself, and whose life's actions are dominated by that love. We are the people who put the other first. How do we attain to so great a calling? I have just laid out for something for you that is virtually impossible. 
how do we love others more than we love ourselves? It goes against human nature. And just as in gravity, if I try to jump as high as I could, no matter how high I jumped, I would eventually come down to earth. So also, if I held my breath and made myself love people to the best of my ability, I would eventually fall back down to earth. Only in Jesus can I remain the lover of other souls. Verse 16, the last verse in our text. I say then, Paul says, because of all this, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The only way daily that I can live in love is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Christian walks obediently. We're not obedient to any man, but we are obedient to the Word of God. The Christian walks prayerfully. I get so frustrated when I hear people say, well, I can't do much. All I can do is pray. Bless your heart. That's the greatest thing on earth you can do. All power resides in God's hands. And when we pray, we reach to God. The Christian citizen walks prayerfully. Pray for our government. Pray for those you don't like. Pray for your political enemies. Instead of praying, Lord, take a lightning bolt and zap, and I'll put a blank there, whoever it is you don't like, pray, Lord, bless that one with a belief, with a faith that if God blesses, they might eventually be saved. They might eventually be touched by God in a way that changes their life. And the Christian walks righteously. As I said earlier, the problems in our country, their solving doesn't begin until we act right. You say, well, preacher, there are other people who are acting worse. Yeah, but we're God's people. We've got to quit asking sinners to act like saints until God's people act like saints. We can't ask anyone to change while we refuse to change. Our nation needs Christians to act like Christians right now. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know that everything that's happening in our nation is under your providential care. We know that you love your people and you protect us. And not one hair on our head will be damaged without your permission. We thank you for our eternal security through Jesus Christ, the proof of which is the presence of the Holy Spirit within our heart. But Lord, we also know that you command that we turn or burn, that we either repent or we face the wrath that comes from non-repentance. Make us your holy people. We hear your call. And Lord, we answer it. Bless those who would slander us. Bless those who hate us. Bless those who would destroy us. Bless those who lie awake at night plotting ways to end us. And if it be your will, give us the opportunity to speak your word to them, your gospel, 
that they might be saved. Now lead us in the way eternal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.